this opportunity right now to thank the 41 people from the uh, Rogers Morrisby chapter and the Larry Durkin chapter who volunteered to help with this presentation this, this convention together.
they went to the playoffs four of those five years. Pretty impressive record. The advantage of the winning percentage is 5 to 33. Currently, Larry, the special advisor for the president's company, has goes to be Ryan. And he's also an advocate for literacy. Please help me in public. Larry. He said, what? 
And I said, well, you know, you look at these guys. They look like they're at a funeral. You know, if you want to play your best, you know, it'll actually loosen up a little bit. Uh, and so, you know, have you ever seen a guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt that wasn't having a good time? <laughs> he said, well, yeah, I understand. I get your point, but where's yours? I said, well, I'll wear it tomorrow. Well, we were staying in a hotel that was right across from a large shopping mall in Miami, Florida. And when I went there the next day to find a Hawaiian shirt, I couldn't find one single shirt in the entire mall. That's how unpopular they were. I did find a shirt with some flowers on it. And so I wore that to the game. And so, in a way, uh, I would say that what happened that day actually had a lot to do with me being a white shirt guy, but also some, something to do uh, with how I got the manager's job. You can ask Dallas Smith about that. <laughs> so I come out, a fan came up when we got back to Houston and gave me two shirts. And one of them had a lot of these Woody Station wagons with the uh, surfboards on top. And so I got home and I looked at that and I, I thought about, you know, what we could do. You're, you're, you're stretching for things to talk about to entertain people when you've just blown the pennant race in September. And I think, I'm going to wear this shirt tomorrow and I'm going to get my life. So I came to the ballpark and I had this shirt on it. Before the game started, I, I said, Milo, you're you know on this area. He said, uh, no station wagon? <laughs> I had just learned myself that the term Woody was a slang expression for an erection. Milo was about 10 years older than me, and I knew he would not know that. So I said, no, it's not a station wagon, it's a Woody. These are, these are the most popular cars. When I was growing up in California, you know, with the surfboards and everything, that was the thing. He said, well, I didn't know they called them that. I said, well, now you know. So, we were, we, Milo would set the stage. But he would set the stage for a couple of innings, and then maybe somebody went to the mound. I could see we had a little bit of time. So, I said, uh, Milo, or, <laughs> on radio, as you know, you have to paint the picture. People can't see what you're talking about. And nobody loves to paint that picture more than Milo has. So, we get to the third inning or so, and I said, Milo, uh, how do you like it? I know the white shirt. Oh, uh, you mean the one with all the woodies on it? <laughs> yeah, I was, if you were a young fella, did, did you ever have a woody? He <laughs> said, oh no, we were much too poor. <laughs> and I said, boy, that's really poor. So, now I'm loosened up. Now you're loosened up. And uh, maybe I can find my place. <laughs> you know, this is one of the reasons I've read this out. This is the first audience I've ever spoken to where most of the people in the crowd know more about baseball than I do. And, you know, I can't really talk about the history of the sport, you know that. I can't really talk about Sabre Metrics, you know all about that. So, Really, about the only thing I feel like I can do is give you a sense of what it's like and how it feels from the inside out. First of all, I'd like to tell you something that you probably already know, but I want to emphasize it. Baseball is a really, really hard sport to play. A lot harder than it looks. I have often said that the game of baseball 
the difficulty of the game of baseball increases directly with your proximity to the ball. <laughs> if you're watching on TV, there's nothing to it. You know? If you're up in the upper deck, it doesn't look that hard. Sometimes when a, the, the guys in the dugouts know how it is, and sometimes when a pitcher is really getting ripped, somebody will yell, get the married man off the infield. And that's how I felt one day when I was about 40 years old. It was my first old timers game. And I went out, I was standing around shortstop, and I had a couple of missiles fly by me, and I was giving it the old leg. I said, I better get out of here. So I, I got in the outfield, and I started looking around, and I thought, how can three guys cover all this territory? <laughs>
I don't know what the real is about, but I think <laughs> they're artful. You know, they're just not the same. Push it this way, push it that way. It's different. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Buckville line that day. The score stood 4 to 2, with but an inning left to play. With Cooney down at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence came upon the patrons of the game. Most of the great old ballparks and golf courses were built long before any of us were born. It was different game back then. When Ernest Thayer wrote those immortal lines, 10,000 eyes were on him when he rubbed his hands in dirt. 5,000 tons of blood when he wiped them out his shirt. And while the rivaling pitchers round the ball into his hip, <coughs> the fire gleamed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. 5,000 fans. It's a big crowd back there. These days, you go broke. <laughs> these days are a lot different. And so part of what I'm doing is, you know, what was it, what is it? You know a lot of it. It's just the way I look at it. Some things are still the same. The pitch is still standing 60 feet from the hitter. The bases are still 90 feet apart. The rules haven't changed very much, but it takes so much longer to play a game now. The big clock in center field doesn't tell you when the game will end, but back in the days of Casey and on through Bay Ruth, the games lasted about two hours. <laughs> now they last three. So, we're proud in some ways about saying baseball's a game that doesn't have a clock. And golf doesn't have a clock either. But if you're like I am, you're noticing that the pacing of the game isn't quite the same. So if you look at a crowd uh, and you probably see some of these pictures in this Houston baseball book, you've got pictures of the crowd back in Babe Ruth's day. <laughs> you see almost no women and children, first of all. But man, are aggressive business attire. They may be wearing uh, newsboys' caps, bowlers, hoppers, or the occasional boater. And they're almost always smoking big cigars. Um, in the sensitivity of the 21st century, you don't see anything like that anymore. Almost nobody is dressed in business attire. There's lots of kids, there's lots of women, and instead of cigars, they have cell phones. So, it's a different day and a different era. Personally, I would prefer a stogie on a cool day. Uh, and if you had Luis Gonzalez on your team, you would probably get the good Havana cigars when you were with a pennant. But when I started broadcasting, the commercial break between innings was 60 seconds. <coughs> when I was pitching, I could go out to the mound and warm up and be ready for the first hitter in a minute. No problem. But now the breaks are two, two minutes long or two and a half minutes long. And I know that Fred Arnold with the Minute Maid doesn't mind that because I do nice commercials for Minute Maid. We spend that time sometimes talking about baseball history. But it is a long break, and sometimes the players sit on the bench when the inning's over. And then they're going to run out to their positions until 30 seconds or a minute has gone by because they don't want to stand around the time. So that part's built in. You know, we're not going to change the commercials part of baseball. We have to make the money to buy the players and provide the entertainment that we enjoy so much. But I think the other half hour that gets us to three minutes uh, is something that we might be able to do something about. In a way, it's another thing that reminds me of golf. A lot of times I'll be playing and I can tell the 
force them in front of us. Uh, they're good players. You know, I can see their swings. When they get on the green, they're walking all around and taking their time. And somebody probably in the says, these guys must have a lot of money on the line. Well, think about how that relates to baseball now. We've got the pitcher, he's walking around the mound, talking to himself, you know, looking at the, see what notes on the bottom of his hand. He, he's trying to figure out what he's going to throw for the next pitch. It's kind of like a golfer walking all around trying to light up a putt. There's a lot of money on it. And you see the hitter. The hitter steps out of the box. He, you know, he fixes his batting gloves, takes a couple of breaths, and gets back into the batter's box. He's moving his feet like this. He puts his hand back to the umpire because he's not quite ready yet. And then when he's finally ready, okay, he's ready to hit. All that stuff takes time. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. But you know if you can take 10 seconds here, 15 there, and stretch that out over the course of the game, I think you save a lot. Case in point. The 1941 World Series Game 4. Dodgers up 4-3, to three, two outs in the ninth. Two strikes in the count, and you know the rest. Tommy Hendrick swings. He misses you, Casey Spitter. He gets by Mickey Owen. Hendrick reaches first base. The Yankees come back and win the game. I doubt if many of you have heard Mel Allen's call of that sequence, but I have. And what amazes me more than anything is it was no more than five seconds after the pass ball that Allen said, so Henry reaches first, now the first pitch to the Maggio. Five seconds, I mean, he, he said it so fast, it was almost like the Maggio was running up to the batter's box while Henry was running down to first base, and the pitcher was ready to throw as soon as Joe, Joe got in there. See, if you heard that, you know, you would say, the game was different back then. You know, this couldn't happen to me. If it happened now, it would be five minutes, not five seconds. I mean, they're going to have a meeting on the mound. They'll probably change pitchers. There might be a conference with the umpire. Uh, you know, the next pitch would be a long time coming. As a broadcaster, I was amused from time to time when one of our cameras would pick up somebody in the stands reading a book. And, of course, most people thought that was sacrilege. I want to tell you, when I watch games at home, I read a book now. <laughs> I can read a lot and not miss anything. So, you know, I love the game. No matter how long it takes to play it, I still love the game. But I think you couldn't pick up the pace. Sometimes it seems like it gets to the point of paralysis by analysis. I'm not the first one to voice this concern. And this is where I must insert the disclaimer. The opinions expressed in this speech are mine. <laughs> I do not speak for MLB or the Houston Astros. So here's what I do about it. The first thing is I would elevate the home plate umpire to the position of God. <laughs> he would signal the batter to get into the batter's box or the pitcher to get onto the road. Get in a hit or a strike one. Get up there and pitch or it's ball one. Now he wouldn't like that. You know, it would cause a little anxiety, a little bad blood. Players probably wouldn't like it right away either, but I think they could get used to it. What would surely infuriate the home plate umpire is what I would do next. I always thought that I could call balls and strikes better from the mound than the umpire. <laughs> Honestly, even the ones where I threw a ball and called it a strike, if I was on the mound, I knew I could. I knew what it was. If he thought it was a strike, he'd call it a ball the other way around. But I thought I could do a better job. I think I could call balls and strikes better by watching TV than I could if I was crouching behind the catcher. 
The catcher's moving around, the pitches are darting in and out, and this guy back there is supposed to try to call one across that plane uh, at the front of home plate. It's really hard. I don't think I could do that better than they could do it. I just think it could be done better from the vantage point behind the pitcher rather than behind the catcher. So, my modest proposal <laughs> is that I would use that technology. I put a little buzzer in the home plate umpire's left pocket and another one in his right. <laughs> With the pitch across the plate, he would know if it's a ball or a strike. <laughs> the ball would be over here, the strike would be over here. And it wouldn't add one second to the playing time of the game. The pitchers would like it because it would be consistent. The hitters the same way. When I started pitching, they said, Look, you've got to learn the umpire strike zone and pitch to his zone. Well, sometimes you throw a pitch, and it would be a borderline pitch and you call it a strike. And you get to three and two, and you throw the same exact pitch and he calls it a ball. Well, how can you get used to that? It just, you know, for me, it only really makes sense. But, you know, it is the way it is. And it's probably not going to change. So, what I would end up doing, the, the point of it all, would be that I would hope to achieve a system where the home plate umpire, as God, is the most important arbiter in the game, not because he could call Casey out on strikes, but because he would dictate the pace of the game. As long as I'm this far out on the limb, let me say that I am no fan of the replay system either. It only shows that the umpires miss a fair number of really close calls. It probably adds 10 minutes to each game, and by my reckoning, all those missed calls would even out over the course of 162 games. Of course, it's hard for things to even out in a short series. And I do think the replay system would be good in postseason because one or two calls could change the whole series. When you get you play 162 to get to the playoffs, you don't want to get knocked out of the playoffs by one bad outcome. Well, I would, you know, who cares if the game lasts a little longer than I would use it in the playoffs. The regular season, I'd say, get on with it. You know, I can't tell you how silly it seems to me. How ridiculous it looks to me to see an, a, a manager strolling out on the field to talk to the umpire that he thinks is just as a call and then standing there and, and talking amiably with him, looking to the dugout and waiting to get the signal as to whether the call was the right call or the wrong call. I mean, I think there was a good bit of theater in the old way. <laughs> You know, you think about Billy Martin, Earl Weaver, Lou Pinello, Tommy Lasorda out there stomping around, throwing their hats down. You know, it's kind of fun to watch stuff like that. It's, for me, you know, where is the entertainment value of walking, you get kept walking out going, hey, you know, I'm going. You know, what are they doing? There's no entertainment value in that. So, I get rid of it. And one more thing, uh, as long as I'm at it, it's time to modify the designated hitter rule and go get both leagues on the same page. <laughs> well, you're cheering, but you know it's not going to happen. I have a compromise that I think would be better. It would allow the great hitters to play a couple more years after they're no longer good fielders. It would put the manager in a str strategic mind as early as the second or third inning. It would drive the general manager crazy trying to get the roster right for his manager. And I think 
then the rule, the new rule, uh, would be better because it has that timeless quality of simplicity. The simple rule would be a manager can pinch hit for his pitcher anytime he wants to without removing the pitcher from the game. But the player who hits for it may not come back in the game. Do you want that for a while? Think about that. It's the second inning. The pitcher's up, you got men on second and third. You've got to hit it on your bench because you've saved on your bench because he can hit this pitcher, but he's not a very good fielder. Do you extend him in the second inning? You can't bring him back in the ninth inning because he's also had some luck against the other team's closer. Think of what you have to do as a manager. If you had to think about whether to hit for the pitcher every time he came up. For me, I was a savior bullets manager. Most of the time, I would just let the pitcher hit. I'd want to have all my weapons when I got down to the later part of the game. Because I've noticed you probably have to. Uh, a lot of games, uh, one team starts out way ahead, the other team comes back. You know, it looks like it's one way, then it's the other. And then the games where you would at least expect it, you're in the eighth or ninth inning, and it's a close game, and the managers are all out, pitch and it's really pitches. So I was a safety bullish guy. But even, you know, other guys that like to strike when the iron's hot, I think it would make it really interesting. I think, uh, you know, you could be second guessing the manager in the second inning, and yep. anyway, I think it would be better. And I think you, you wouldn't be saying you've got to get rid of these great hitters. You could keep them for situations. You just could use them four times. <coughs> so, finally, since I've been ragging on the game enough to suggest that I'm not pleased with it, I've saved the best for last. The steer is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched and hate. He pounds with cruel violence. His bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. All oh, somewhere in this favorite land, the sun is shining bright. A band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere the children shout. But there is no joy in London. Mighty Casey has struck out. That matchup between the great hitter and the great pitcher with the game on the line is still the most riveting tableau in all of sports. And that goes for Casey, for the Babe, Splendid Splinter, Jolton Joe, it goes for Willie Mickey, and for Henry, for every great hitter who has come after and is still to come. And for all the great pitchers who have looked down at them when it's three and two, and it's me and you. Thank you.
So with that, let's start off with the Lee Allen Award. Now, the Lee Allen Award in 1996 was initiated by Sabre, and it was subsequently named Lee Allen at a later point in time in honor of the historian of the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, until his death in 1969. And it honors the best baseball research project at the annual National History Day competition uh, that is in, in Washington each year. An annual event in which students compete on a regional basis, followed by the state competition, and then the national finals. It's actually at the University of Maryland. And this year's winner, again, not present today, but this year's winner is Harrison O'Brien of South Hamilton, Massachusetts, for the topic, The Kurt Flood Case, Free Agency for Athletes. So congratulations to Harrison. Next award is the Jack Cavanaugh Memorial Youth Baseball Research Award. And, and this award was established in 1999 in recognition of Cavanaugh's writing and research achievements and his contributions to Sabre. The award was presented for the first time at the Sabre National Convention in West Palm Beach, Florida in 2000 and has been presented every year since. We have two winners this year, one in the college division and one in the high school division. And the winner in the college, college division is Cyrus Kettle from the University of Kentucky for a work called Reassessing DiMaggio. And the second winner is from the high school division, Abraham Griesbauer, for his work entitled Rube Foster. So congratulations to the two colleagues. Now, the Ron Gabriel Award annually honors the author or authors of the best research published or unpublished on the subject of the Brooklyn Dodgers completed during that past year. And of course, as many of you know, Ron Gabriel was passionate about his Dodgers. And the winner for this year are uh, John G. Zinn and Paul G. Zinn for their work Ebbets Field, published by McFarland Press. Congratulations to the Zins. Our next award is the McFarland Sabre Baseball Research Awards. And these awards honor the best articles on baseball history or biography completed or published during the preceding calendar year. And we have three winners for this year's award. The first is Rory Costello for Olympic Stadium, and that's part of the Sabre Baseball Bi Biography Project and for August 15th of 2013. The second winner is Christopher Schmidt for Explaining the Baseball Revolution, published in the Arizona State Law Journal in 2013. And the third winner is Tom Schieber, for The Pride of Sikh Men, published in Baseball Researcher on February 3rd of 2013. So please, a warm congratulations to all of you. <laughs> now for the Sabre Baseball Research Award, uh, this honors those whose outstanding research projects completed during the past year at, which have significantly expanded our knowledge or understanding of baseball. We have three winners to this award, too. The first winner is present, I believe, and I'd like to ask him to stand up at his table so we can acknowledge him, and that's Daniel Gilbert for expanding the strike zone, baseball in the age of free agency, University of Massachusetts Press. <laughs> David fought for the Farmers Game, Baseball in Rural America by Johns Hopkins University Press. And the third winner is a group of authors, Siobhan Bond, Ryan Croton, Tom Karakolis, and Dan Ramsey 
for fastball velocity trends in short season minor league baseball. And this was published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. So congratulations to all three of our award winners. The next award I'd like to present is the prestigious Henry Chadwick Award. Now we have two of the five winners present, and I will be calling up those two, uh, those two winners to accept their award and, and make a few remarks here at the podium. But to remind everyone, the Chadwick Award was established in 2009 to honor baseball's great researchers, historians, analysts, and archivists for their invaluable contributions to making baseball the game that links America's present with its past. And apart from honoring individuals for their contribution to the study and enjoyment of baseball, the Chadwick Award is intended to educate the baseball community about sometimes little known but significant research contributions and thus encourage the next generation of researchers. The first Chadwick Award winner that I would like to acknowledge and recognize is Ernie Lanigan. Ernie Lanigan was a baseball statistics fanatic whose uncle actually started the Sporting News in 1886. Two years later, at the age of 15, Ernie started working there, and he later became curator and historian at the Hall of Fame. I strongly encourage you to read Lyle Spatz's biography of Ernie Lanigan in the recent issue of the Baseball Research Journal. So congratulations to the honor of Ernie Lanigan. The second winner I'd like to announce is Mark Okenen. Frankly, much of what we know about baseball uniforms today, we owe to Mark Okenen. His books visually documented the history of baseball uniforms. And again, for more information on Mark, please read Dan Levitt's bio of Okenen in the BRJ. The third winner is John C. Tattersall name that is familiar, deeply familiar to many of us, and is much more associated with the home run log in its early days. John Thorne has written a wonderful bio of Tattersall in the BRJ, and he speaks of his groundbreaking work in comprehensively documenting the home run, but he was also an authority on early baseball records. So once again, you can read more about John in, in the Baseball Research Journal and John Thorne's bio.
this award is for researchers, and I'm not a researcher, I'm a data capture person. And I look at the people, uh, some of the people who won the award before me, people like Bill James, Dave Smith, John Thorne, Pete Palmer, Sean Foreman. These are the legends of our industry, of my industry, who have done so much to inspire me uh, personally and professionally. And there are also several other people I'd like to mention who, who haven't won this honor yet. But if I have a vote going forward, uh, I have a 10-man Hall of Fame vote for the Chadwick Award, so I'd like to mention them. Uh, John Dewan, Steve Moyer, and Sean Lehman, pioneers of data capture and distribution that have been able to so much research. Uh, groundbreaking researchers, Dick Kramer, Nate Silver, Keith Moore, and Horace McCracken, uh, who've really created some of the pillars of modern uh, research and analytics. And fantastic writers like Rob Meyer, Joe Sheehan, and Alan Schwartz, who've really spread analytics and research and sabermetrics into the mainstream mindset of baseball fans. So uh, that's my 10-member future Chadwick Hall of Fame. Um, we at BAM say that uh, we play for the name on the front of the jersey, not the name on the back. So I'm representing all of MLB.com and all of MLBAM today. And on behalf of everybody there, uh, I thank, thank everyone for the award. Uh, this list, of course, starts with Commissioner Selig, who had the vision and foresight back in 2000 to create MLB Advanced Media. And to our CEO, Bob Bowman, whose passion and vision uh, and energy and brilliance inspire everything we do. Our mission is to bring baseball to fans everywhere, no matter where they are, what they're doing, or what device they're, they are using. Uh, and Bob drives that vision every single day. Um, one more group I want to mention uh, and thank, and not by name, I assure you, it's a very long list of names. Uh, the 25 full-time employees and over 300 part-time employees in our department. People responsible for being in the ballpark, being in our office and actually recording the events as they happen and creating the events, uh, creating the records. And these people really have a great passion for what they do. Uh, they treat every game the same, whether it's Game 7 of the World Series or the Dominican Summer League or a test game for our future field tracking system. They have a great passion for recording data and information and helping create the history of the game. I'm very lucky to have a, people, a group of people like that working with me. Um, the famed architect Lewis Kahn once said, it's important that you honor the material that you use. You can only do it if you honor the brick and glorify the brick instead of shortchanging it. And I have a team of people who honor and glorify data, and hopefully we can use it to continue to build greater monuments to this great game that we all love. Thank you very much. approximately 2,900 bios that have now been written. Mark, Mark is also a Bob Davis Award winner, and I would like to now call him up so that I can present him with the prestigious Chadwick Award.
really hundreds of people uh, that work on this project. Uh, Sabre is a group of people that are very important to me. I've worked with many of you. I hope to work with many of you in the future. Uh, I expect uh, I have more research ahead of me, and I hope I can I can uh, deserve this eventually. Thank you very much.
go out to graves. And, uh, and I get my decade mixed up too, so bear with me. Uh, and, yeah, Hank Aaron cleared the bases in the ninth inning against Don Blystale. And Donald's assistance is, Donald, get rid of your car. And then, Car with extended pedals and it's three foot six. And he, he drove rapidly and said, We'll meet you in front of Hayden Church on Wisconsin Avenue and then we'll go out and celebrate. As we're getting closer, I said, Oh, there's Donna. You know, but he says, No, that's the fire hydrant. <laughs> I could kid about it because Donna used to tell the story about himself. And he said, My roommate here thought I was the, the fire hydrant. Wisconsin Avenue. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think you better bring the towel up. I'm running out of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> when you reach that stage, you forget to talk with my cell phone. Oh, yeah, it's in my hand, right? Well, oh, another gentleman I want to record. Uh, tell about him. Deacon Jones. Finally, I met him. He was touring as the American Legion Player of the Year. He was actually the first African American to have a, a picture in the Hall of Fame. He's never lost a sense of humor, but I have bled for him because he had a very damaged right shoulder. So if you want to play first base and you can try to throw it, make it throw at the plate. He was in distress and hurting. And uh, had he had the designated hitter been in effect, I think he'd had a Hall of Fame career as a designated hitter. Love your spirit. I was so deeply impressed about their new ballpark here for the Atlantic League. And it was beyond. It's a lot better than my Hartford, Connecticut club. And I still broke into baseball in the East of late in 1951. And uh, I, I just had a great time last night to see how, how well it's designed. And, uh, and everybody that's been responsible for that ballpark, I thank you. <laughs> So on, and I wish I had uh, time to pay tribute to all of those that I had a chance to 
worked with and know at uh, Cincinnati and Houston and the Yankees. They're, they're, they're a great part of the game. I know many of you in this room uh, certainly recognize uh, that. And I think anything that can be done to promote the memories and the contributions of scouting is uh, certainly, certainly well worthwhile and, uh, and warranted. Uh, the second major reason this is so meaningful to me is the fact that I'm the recipient of a award that bears the name of Roland Heaney. Uh, Roland and I go back, I uh, first met him in 1958, so we've got a 57 year history. He was with the, with the Milwaukee Braves at that time, and I was starting my career at the Cincinnati Reds in scouting and player development. Uh, so Roland and I have been, have been professional associates for obviously the, the 57 years of dear personal friends uh, for a great many of those years. We have an opportunity to work on many things together. Now is not the time to discuss it, but we were both very interested in Dirk's remarks and uh, what about pace of the game because Roland and I have an opportunity to work together on a committee that's just been launched that includes Pat Gillick, uh, Sparky Lyle, Bud Harrelson, Cecil Cooper, and Joe Klein that are uh, studying pace of the game and are implementing starting today, August 1, a number of initiatives in the Atlantic League on a trial basis to see what we can do to make the game a more enjoyable experience for everybody and to pick up the pace. So again, thanks for this award. Yeah, I've enjoyed this convention uh, uh, immensely. I've been a Sabre member going back to the early 1980s. It's the first chance in many years I've had uh, to attend the national convention. I think it's been uh, superb and I've enjoyed visiting with a great many of you and I look forward to it. Thank you.
afternoon. <coughs> I met Leslie Beefy in 1995 at the Pittsburgh Convention when she gave an excellent presentation on the rich heritage of black baseball in the area. I've always been happy to run to the tour at every convention since. Leslie is Associate Professor of History at Kent State University at Stark, teaching survey classes along with courses in Asian, 20th century, American, and sports history. Her major research areas are the Negro Leagues, women's sports, and race, gender, and sports. Leslie joined Sabre in 1989 and has always been an active member. She's chaired the Women in Baseball Committee since 1995. Elected to the Board of Directors in 2010, she can, sorry, continues to serve with distinction. Leslie is also a first-rate scholar and researcher. Her work resulted in the 1950s team rosters in the Negro League's book in 1994. McFarland published her magnum opus so far, the Negro League's 1869 to 1960. Since then, and with McFarland, she has edited or co-edited the Encyclopedia of Women in Baseball 2006 and two collections of Black Baseball in Chicago and Kansas City. In 2008, she became founding editor of the Journal of Black Ball, a position she holds to this day. <coughs> Leslie hasn't slowed down. As we speak, she's spearheading a team book project on the Colorado Silver Bullets. Leslie carries her achievements lightly. Everything she does, she does with good sense, good humor, and goodwill. Everyone in Sabre knows Leslie for her genuine smile and welcoming hand. To know Leslie is to know why we're in Sabre. We get to meet people who share our very interest in baseball and offer friendship and kindness. We get to meet Leslie Beefy, this year's recipient of the Bob Davids Award. such a wonderful group. Uh, congratulations to all the others who uh, won this award. To be a part of that is truly amazing. And I can just simply say, I'm truly honored, humbled, and thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thanks.